Today's book is called Muley Ears, Nobody's Dog by Marguerite Henry, illustrated by Wesley Dennis. <clears throat> Muley Ears was a big dog, belonged to no one, played with on the white uh, beach of Jamaica. Uh, I think the white sand beach of Jamaica, and was always full of fun. His family was whichever family rented the house each month. He didn't get lonesome, and the children didn't miss their pets who they left behind. He showed them all his secret places, went swimming, and in turn was always fed. One month, a scowling man arrived all alone. No snorkels, no camera. He wouldn't even talk, and the only sticks he threw were at muley ears, muley ears to go away, and muley ears got hungry, very hungry. Muley ears was lonely, too. So he hid the man's lunch, but he didn't eat it. The man was mad, but he also learned a lesson that sharing is fun. And then they were friends from now on. Some of the books that the author has written was Justin Morgan Had a Horse. So that's about the um, beginnings of Morgan Horses, which if you read the Little House on the Prairie books, you will know that Almanzo uh, drove a team of Morgan Horses. Um, Let's see, there was Newberry Medal in 1949 for King of the Wind, a story of an Arabian horse, and her best love book is Misty of Chincoteague, um, about the annual roundup of ponies on the island off the North, Car North Carolina coast, and it was made into a movie. About the illustrator, he also illustrated Justin Morgan Had a Horse. Okay. Uh, this book was published in 1964, and this is a special edition. It says, To the special boat boy who introduced me to the special dog who owns a special house on the Isle of Jamaica. In Jamaica, you might say muley yaz instead of muley ears. And you might catch me saying muley yaz nobody's dog. Oh, it was copyrighted in 1959. Okay. On the sunny, sunny, turtle-shaped isle of Jamaica, there lives a dog whose name is Muley Ears. I need more light. Let's see if we can get some more light on the book. Okay. He was a strapping, deep-chested fellow with a coat of many colors, white and black and brown, with a patch on his shoulder as yellow as a banana. The shaggy natives say, <laughs> the shaggy natives, I'm having trouble today, can you tell? <laughs> the natives say the shaggy whiteness comes from his grandmother, an old English sheepdog, the blue-black is the mark of his German Shepherd grandfather. There are tales, too, of an Irish setter aunt and an Alsatian uncle and litters of mixed-up cousins. But Muleyers does not look mixed up at all. He has great dignity. His ears are the most magnificent part of him. They are simply abnormous. That sounds like a combination of the word abnormal and enormous. They stand up straight in the air as if they were wired. In fact, when he sights a friend or a fish, he pricks them up sharply. They almost meet overhead. And that, of course, is how Muley Ears came by his name. For years, not counting one month, he has gone along happy as a clam in high tide. His, the whole beach is his playground. With his hackles high and his nose low, he stalks the never-ending waves. 
I hear one of my dogs crying because I'm in here and they are outside that door. <laughs> Hang on a second. They have to get the dog. Who's crying? Who's crying? Do you need to go out? Well, they're just crying. We have to be kind to our creatures. Our creatures actually, especially our, our house pets, just have feelings. You can come in if you want to. Back to our book. For years, not counting one month, he has gone along happy as a clam at high tide. The whole beach is his playground. With his hackles high and his nose low, he stalks the never-ending waves as they break upon the shore. Barking fiercely, he plays a game of pounce with the creatures tossed up by the sea, and the sandhoppers and the fiddler crabs and the squid. Some he eats at a gulp and others he chases back into their hidey holes. And when the sun fades into the bigness of night, then he and his moon shadow leap into the air for moths and bats and fireflies that are called peenywallies. Muley ears belongs to nobody. Even so, except for one month, his life has been full of fun and frolic. Everyone on the beach knows him and greets him with a uh, hi fellow or hi muley or sometimes they use his full title of muley ears. And what's more, he does have a home. It's a friendly house. Just a quick scramble up his very own trail through the jungle of palms and breadfruit trees. Its windows are screenless for jumping in and out and its bare floors have been polished by many sandy feet, including his own. This house is a for rent house. Every full moon or so, a new family arrives, with children swarming up the steps carrying snorkels and fins and cameras and baskets, picnic baskets. <laughs> Muley Ears appoints himself their dog until they move out. It is a fine arrangement. He doesn't get lonesome. He keeps them from being lonesome for the dog they left behind. With all the comings and goings, Muley Ears is busier than a water bug. He makes it his job to show the boys and girls his favorite haunts. The dark cave where the clouds of bats hang upside down at, at the river's bank where the oysters grow on trees, the rocky ledge where lizards play skitter tag. See the oysters on the trees, it looks like maybe the tide comes up. I'd like to know more about oysters growing on trees in Jamaica. He latches onto each new family as tightly as a barnacle fastens to the hull of a boat. If his people go rafting, he goes rafting. Wee, what fun, shooting the rapids. How the wind tickles his big ears as the current sweeps the bamboo raft through rocky ravines and gorges, right down to the sea. Along the shores, brown Jamaican children, all elbows and knees, dance like puppets on a string. Gaily they blow their piping whistles at muley ears. Their mothers bent over piles of washing, looking up, laughing at a wave and waving a sudsy shirt and shorts at him. Oh, rafting is great. I can't imagine how much fun it would be to see a dog riding on a raft and to see them riding on a raft regularly. I can't imagine how wonderful it would be to live by the ocean and to have my skin constantly exposed to the sun and, and browned and tan. Okay, maybe some of you will get to go to the seashore this summer. We'll see. By lunchtime, Muley Ear's belly is all lean and empty. 
He can hardly wait for his family to choose their picnic spot on the beach. He can hardly wait for them to open their food hamper. Always there are choice bits of him, bits for him to share. Sometimes a cold lobster or nubbins of roast pork or codfish fritters or even a bone to work on. When lunch is over, his people often snooze in a nearby fern thicket. Then he snuggles down alongside them and snores louder than the best. Later when they go swimming, of course he goes swimming. He carries their towels and sand pails. He fetches balls and sticks for them. And in return, they carefully search through his coat for mean, miserable ticks and quickly pluck them out. Afterward, they all sit facing out to sea, watching the birds and boats go sailing by. Muley Ears wiggles in very close to the children, not minding their damp bathing suits at all. Bursting with love, he just shares his wetness, batting them with his happy, soppy tail. That's something that makes books special. Happy, soppy tail. What a wonderful thing to say. Whatever his family does, Muley Ears does too. But one night a week, instead of being a tag-along, he shows them what to do. He insists on leading them to the docks where the bananas are loaded. Each time he enjoys it all over again. The torch flames dancing like sheets of lightning, but no thunder coming afterwards. The glistening women shuffling from trucks to barges stamping and swaying to their own singing. In high spirits, he frisks alongside them. He moves much faster than they do. After all, he has no heavy bunch of bananas to carry on his head. This is very interesting. I think Jamaica is very different from where we live. And the types of things that they grow in their gardens are very different too. I don't think we have any banana trees here. Then on Saturdays, he takes his people to the big outdoor market. While, while they are shopping, he sniffs up and down the rows, enjoying, enjoying the exciting smells and little handouts from the fishmongers. If he upsets a huge tray of fruit with his busy tail, nobody seems to mind. It's just our muley ears, they laugh, as they pick up the scattered limes and mangoes. Going home on the twisty road, muley ears often stops to rub noses with a nodding donkey. Jump up, boy, the children shout. Match your ears to his, we'll take your picture. And up he goes onto the donkey's back. Perched there between the loaded side baskets, he poses, big chested and proud, while the cameras click. Life is good. But one month, when the moon was not new, a scowling man with no family at all moved into the for rent house. Muley Ears was puzzled as he watched him come puffing up the path. Here's my dog again. What's the matter, buddy? What's the matter? You want to come in? He just wanted to come in and lay down where I was. Because dogs have feelings. Are you still crying? You should come over here for a pet while I read the book. Wow. This is a bad time of day to read the book <laughs> when the dogs are crying. <sighs> the man carried only an airline zipper bag. No cameras, no inner tubes, not even a snorkel. He was built like a pigeon, pompous and round in front, and he even walked pigeon toed. This man didn't talk. Not to himself. Not to anyone. He didn't even talk to Muley Ears. He only threw sticks and stones at him, but not for fetching. From the very first, it was plain to see. He just did not like company, four-legged or two. Think of it. The man didn't even own a picnic basket. He took his lunch down to the beach in a flimsy box tied with a thin string. And what a glutton was he. He could eat a great hunk of sausage, a whole crayfish, and a loaf of rich, sweet banana bread all by himself. He didn't seem to understand that a dog came with the house and that of course it was his job to feed him. 
At first, Muley ears stood by, lips drooling, eyes imploring. He watched sausage disappear, then fish, then bread, but no crumb came his way. Something was very wrong. Not one of his families ever had behaved so strangely. How could he show the man that way that people were supposed to act? He tried his best pleading, sitting up on his haunches. He begged, he barked sharp and clear. He offered to shake hands, first one forepaw, then the other. For answer, the man picked up a gnarled root and heaved it at muley ears. At last, the dog gave up. He turned tail and wandered forlornly up the beach. As the month dragged by, he grew thinner and sadder. He kept alive on skimpy rations, little ticky-tick fish and minnows and mullets from the river. Once a week he went to market, but market days were far apart, and the few scraps from the fishmongers only teased his hunger. A great lump of loneliness grew heavy inside of him, and his once magnificent, magnificent ears drooped. He began to hate the fat, fat man with the bulging box of unshared lunch. He tried visiting nearby inns for friendship and for food, but it wasn't the same as having his own private family. Besides, almost all inns had special well-fed dogs who took charge of the leftovers. They wanted no help from hungry strays. You get off our property, they growled. On your way, you skinny snooper. Muley years might have wasted away that one, except that one morning his luck turned. A fisherman's trap caught on a sharp edge of a, of a coral, and one by one the fish escaped through the hole in the wire. He snapped them all up. Mmm, they were plump and tender. The first time in weeks his stomach had stretched tight. Happily, and like the gentleman that he was, he wiped his mouth in a fern bed. Then he lolled and rolled, rubbing his back in the sand. It was a sticky warm day, with no on and offshore breezes. So when at noon, the man waddled down to the beach. He did not eat at once. Instead, he carefully set his lunchbox in the shade of a sea grape tree. Then he went swimming. Of course, he didn't really swim. He just floated. Muley Ears was no longer hungry. But from sheer dog habit, he pounced on the unguarded lunch and hauled it away. Without opening the box at all, he buried it in the sand far up the shore. There might well be other days when he'd have no fisherman's luck. After a while, the man came dripping out of the sea, shaking the water from each ear. He was hungry, as hungry as an alligator. Now for his lunch. He made a beeline for the tree, but the lunch was gone. Sausage, string box, and all. There was only a smooth square place in the sand. Where in the world was it? First he looked skyward. Had some bird swooped off and taken it? Some heron or pelican, perhaps? Then he looked around about him and suddenly he bent double, staring at paw prints in the sand. Why, that sneaky thief, he sputtered under his breath. He can't get away with this. Waddling very fast, he followed the tracks, but the tide was coming in and lapping and lapping and washing the paw prints away. Now for the first time, he spoke aloud. He raged and roared. He bellowed like a bull. Where's my lunch, you robber? He shouted to the small figure in the distance. Where is it? Where? He was so busy shaking his fist at muley ears 
that he stubbed his toe against something poking up and out of the sand. It was the corner of a box, his lunch. He made a grab for it and angrily tore the box open. Everything was there. The dog had not stolen so much as a crumb. I just can't believe it, the man muttered. I just can't believe it. He looked long and hard at Muley Ears, who was waiting far up the beach, watching, watching and listening. Suddenly the man felt a prick of shame. Red-faced, he pulled on his pants over his wet suit and climbed slowly and thoughtfully up to the house. For all the rest of the day, he stayed inside. Through the window, Muley Ears could see him pacing up and down. What was he doing in there? Why, did, why didn't he come out? Once or twice he stood at the window with a half, a look half puzzled and half cross, but his gaze went far out to sea. Muley ears felt strangely bothered. No matter how unfriendly the man had been, he was still living in his house. So that night, he did not sleep on the beach as usual. He waited for the lights in the house to blink out. Then he crept into the clump of lilies just below the bedroom window. He was out of sight yet, so close that he knew every time the man turned in his sleep. The night seemed never ending. The sky, I'm sorry. He watched the moon and the evening star slip down the sky into a pocket of blue mountains. He listened to the man's breathing and to the gentle stirrings of the night breeze. Only toward morning did he sleep. The sun, slanting into the lily bed, nudged him awake. He waited around for a while, then hearing no sounds from the house, he had a good yawn and stretch and trotted down the beach for a swim. He saw nothing of the man until noon. When he did appear, muley ears had to look twice. Was this a different person? So many things about him were changed, even his walk. Instead of waddling down the path, he strode in place. He strode. In place of an old paper box, he carried his lunch in a generous sized large can, lard can. As he settled himself in the shade of the sea grape tree, he took off the lid and whistled coaxingly. Cautiously, one step at a time, muley ears crept forward, nose questing, ears at attention. All senses alert, he wanted so terribly to be friends. But the man, but was the man trying to be friendly? And how could the man be trusted? He sniffed at the wind. He sniffed again, more deeply this time. There was no mistake. It was chicken, fried chicken. His lips drooled, and the man carefully peeled the meat off the drumstick. Then, with an accurate aim, he tossed the whole chunk to Muley Ears, who caught it in the midair. It was delicious, buttery and salty and tender. None of his other families had ever done better. All fears forgotten, Muley Ears trotted up to the man, and there on the beach the two creatures sat side by side, chomping happily. You know, boy, the man spoke and his voice was different from yesterday. Um, as different as sugar is from salt. You taught me a lesson, running off with my lunch and not eating a bite of it. The big ears flicked as if asking for more talk. Four weeks you've tried to give me love and friendship and I couldn't see it. I didn't even share my lunch with you. See, boy, I never had much to do with dogs in the hotel back home. Matter of fact, I guess I've never done much sharing with anybody. But this, he nodded towards the leftovers of the picnic lunch. This is fun. Even if you are only a dumb critter, you'll pardon the expression, he added with a wink. Muley ears, brown eyes shining, winked right back. His paw came down on the man's knee, 
and for sheer joy his tail swept a great happy arc in the sand. And so for the rest of his holiday the man lived in the new way, on the sunny sunny turtle shaped isle of Jamaica, and each day he grew more content. Together the dog and the man walked and rafted and explored the beaches and the riverbanks. Muley Ears showed his friend all the tucked away things that had pleased his other families. The dark cave where clouds of bats hung upside down in the daytime. The old lizard with the special suction pads on his feet for running around on ceilings. The oysters growing on trees. Together they hunted big green turtles to be made into soup. Muley Ears even showed the man how to dog paddle. And always, always the big lunch was shared. When the new moon rode high in the sky again, it was time for the man to leave. Over and over, the last morning he invited Muley Ears to fly home with him to the United States, but of course he couldn't go. A new family with snorkels and fins and cameras and picnic baskets was climbing the path to his house. I thought that was a nice little book about our faithful little doggy friends. I thought of something while I was reading the book. It could be fun to make a raft. My kids actually made a raft out of logs hmm, about the size of maybe a big person's arm. Um, they fashioned it with rope and they actually tried to float it in a stream and it floated a little bit but it kind of sank and then it stayed at the edge of the stream for many many years they would take walks back and say oh there's our raft just kind of would sit there because it was in a place in the woods at a stream where not many people go you can try to make a raft that you can float just in the sink if you want to or in a mud puddle well just a puddle um, when I was a kid, we used to take popsicle sticks and they would float along the gutters of the roads after a big rain and we'd watch how fast they went by. But you can even use popsicle sticks and um, maybe tie the popsicle sticks together with those twisty tie things that come from bags. See if you can make a raft and then see if you can actually float something on your raft like maybe a little plastic toy creature or something. Bye. I enjoyed my time with you today.